I'm glad this morning that Jesus saves, aren't you? Praise the Lord. Good to see you in the house of God today. Great to have you. Looking forward to a good day in the Lord. Beautiful day today. And we're excited about what God is going to do. Let's bow together for a word of prayer. Then we'll enjoy the choir this morning as they sing to us. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for this another beautiful day in the Lord's house. Thank you, God, for the privilege that we have to be able to assemble ourselves together and to worship the King of kings and Lord of lords. Lord, we thank you today. This is our honor. This is our privilege. God, we get to do this, and we thank you for it. Lord, I pray now, God, anoint the choir. I pray for that unction to sing and that touch of God they need. I pray, God, today you'll bless Dr. Hamlin in just a moment as he comes to bring the word of God. Bless the singing today. Lord, we're just looking forward to this Sunday and next Sunday. Two big Sundays here for us with Dr. Hamlin today. And then, Lord, the marriage and a couple's weekend next weekend. God, we pray for just anointing of the Holy Ghost. God, breathe on us in mighty power. Lord, I pray now, give us a good time. The Lord bless Brother John as he's back in the super church. Brother Paquette is in Spanish church. Be Brother Justin and Miss Natalie as they're doing homecoming today for liberty, Lord. Bless them and touch them this morning. God, we pray most of all, God, when we leave this place today, Lord, may we say it's been good to be in the house of God. Lord, help us lift up Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. You be seated and enjoy the choir this morning.
worship one with another as the choir comes down. making a way back to our seat and let's remain standing. Miss Stephanie, get those boys back there and tell them come back into church. They ain't got that problem with the bathroom that bad. Amen. <laughs> they do, praise God. They get 50. They're going to really struggle. But uh, anyway, good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. We're glad you're here. Thank you for being in the service. Choir, what an awesome job this morning. Thank you for that. Ushers, you come on up this morning and uh, we want to go ahead and receive our, our offering this morning. Thank you for being faithful throughout summer to continue and to be faithful to serve the Lord and give you tithe and offering. And we praise the Lord for that. And I want to ask you to continue to pray that God will continue to bless the church and God will continue to move in a special way. And we need God's touch. Amen. Can't do without it. Thank you for the prayers. Had a great service last night. I preached in Chesney, South Carolina last night. Just a good meeting there in the youth meeting. And then I'll be preaching this week, Monday through Thursday, up in East Bend, North Carolina. Actually preaching at the home church with the Nun Sisters are members of. And uh, so I know it's going to be good singing in the meeting this week, whether the preaching is good or not. But uh, anyway, uh, that'll be up at Faith Community Baptist Church up in East Bend. So pray for that meeting. Then the following week, we'll be down with Davy Shelton in a meeting going on in Gateway. And so we're excited about what the Lord's doing these last few uh, days and weeks of October. So you pray that God will bless. One thing I want to mention to you this morning, if you would, please pray for the Booker family. Uh, Miss Wendy and I were down at the hospital on Saturday, and uh, they uh, un um, unplugged the machine down on Saturday and uh, took her off the ventilator. And we stayed with the family for several hours. They wanted us to be there when they took her off. And then about 4.30 in the morning, she passed away. Uh, she knew the Lord is her Savior. She's ready to go home to be with Him. Uh, everything's good on that part. But like I told Miss Tier and Brother Eric that are her children, Tier and Doug, of course, friends of mine, I told them it's still Mama. Amen. And so no matter what age, we feel selfish. My mom's 94, and I still pray every day, Lord, give her good help and help her be good. So you know how it is. Amen. But I want to say this today. Uh, I'll be doing probably that funeral Thursday as well, helping with that. So busy week this week. So you be much in prayer for that family. We'll share a few other things with you here in just a moment. But let's go ahead and pray over the offering and ask the Lord to touch it. And God bless you. Good to have Brother Crabtree back with us from Washington, D.C. And uh, they had a good trip up there. And praise the Lord for that. And glad they're back home safely. My wife looked at me and said, that bus made one more trip. And I said, hallelujah. <laughs> Boy, that thing, we've got the, we got the money worth out of that thing, haven't we? <laughs> and we bought that right after I came to Calvary. I'll be here 17 years in October. And it already was wore out when we got it. <laughs> 30 years old, 200 a million miles or something, and still running good. Praise God. I can't say that for myself. How about y'all? Amen. I feel like I got a million miles on me sometimes. But anyway, look, Brad, you come first. Father, it sure is good to be back in your house this morning. Lord, we just want to tell you one more time, we love you. Thank you for loving old sinners. God, I thank you for protecting us, watching over us. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing here in this place. God, help us to ever be in the center of your perfect will. Lord, we thank you for still saving souls. Lord, I thank you right now for saving Matthew on Friday night. God, continue to save young people, middle-aged people, young adults. God, so many folks still need Jesus in their lives and in their heart. Father, I pray that this 
day that God that you'll overshadow this place be the man of God as he preaches anoint him with your touch and power give us receptive hearts God save that soul God give victory God just do everything that needs to be done here in this place that you might be exalted Father thank you for this time of giving help us to give uh, our very best to you and God I pray you'll bless this offer and use it for your glory and for your honor and we'll thank you for all you do this service in Jesus name we pray Amen Amen Page number 349 in your books. Page number 349, glory to his name. Let's sing it out on the first. Down at the cross where my Savior died. Down where for cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was a blood of Just remain standing with me just a moment. Matthew, come up here if you would. Uh, Friday night, Brother Justin had a get-together for young people, and, and uh, they um, were out back here and had a great time. And I guess you probably did a devotion or something, did you? Or did y'all just play and eat? Play and eat. Anyway, praise the Lord. If God can do that, play and eat. That's really great. Anyway, Matthew got back to his uh, grandparents, went back to their house, and told them he'd been a conviction and wanted to get saved. Amen. So, Matthew, what did the Lord do for you? I got saved. Amen. And how old are you, Matthew? Ten. Matthew's ten years old, gave his life to Jesus uh, this last Friday night. How many of you are thankful for that? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. I love these young people. Thank you, buddy. You can go back with Brother, brother uh, John. He probably needs your help as a bouncer. Uh, I, I appreciate these young people, and I thank the Lord for how God's been moving. So many young people getting saved in this church, teenagers alike. And uh, just so blessed to see. I, I come by this morning, and, uh, you know, I tried my best. Remember your name? I really have tried. But that name is not the easiest name. Remember, tell me one more time. Julian, right? But Joe, you're 18, right? Just a few weeks ago, he got saved. I don't know he's missed a service. I mean, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Amen. Amen. I got it that way, too. Amen. Amen. But uh, I like that. That's awesome. But anyway, we've got to get him baptized and Matthew baptized and a few others have been saved. We praise the Lord for that. And uh, matter of fact, there was a couple others, so we thank the Lord. Uh, that's right. Greg got saved. And he, there's Greg over there today. And then I think... Uh, Let's see, was Miss Heather, was it? Well, I'm trying to think who was. One of my other young ones, wasn't it? That's right, Brother CJ's. That's right. They, have you been, you've been baptized yet? I'm going to hold you under to the bubble stop. <laughs> Amen. So, amen. That's right. You'll be happier even then, won't you? Appreciate AJ. And pray for his daddy, too. Want to see his daddy come to church and get saved. Amen. But boy, I appreciate all these young folk getting saved, teenagers getting saved. Praise the Lord for that. All right, you go ahead and be seated. Brother Bobby, I'm going to switch back to the pulpit, Mike. All right, I want to mention a couple things real quickly to you this morning. 
And we're going to go right on service, give Brother Hamlin time to preach uh, today. Uh, we don't like to get our preachers tied up because the bus and everything rolling, so we try to give them plenty of time. But let me mention a couple things today. Don't forget next weekend. It is going to be a special, special weekend next Sunday. We start on Saturday night. The meal at 6 o'clock is a couple's meal only that are signed up. It is a catered meal, and it is free to you, but it is for couples, no children. There will be no nurseries, uh, no children at all. Only adults need to be at this, or at least wives, and hopefully their husbands will act like adults. Amen. But couples weekend, Saturday at 6 o'clock. And then, after the meal, we're going to be having a women's session for 45 minutes, a men's session for 45 minutes. The ladies' session will go on in this auditorium, and the men's session will go on in the auditorium up on the hill in the Spanish church, and that will be right after the meal. And then, after that, uh, we'll go home. Of course, the next day, Brother Justin Woolwich is going to be preaching on the family that morning. Brother Steve Pope is going to be preaching that night. And he told me he's going to try to bring his church on Sunday night as well. So we may have Calvary North and South here together on Sunday night. And uh, we'll all be together have a good time. We might even throw a combined choir up there, Brother James, and sing something we all know. Amen. But anyway, it's going to be a good time if they can work that out next Sunday night. So don't forget. Does your marriage need a challenge? You say, preacher, my marriage is good. Well, ask your wife. Amen. But uh, anyway, it always can be better. Can I get an amen right there? It always can be better. And we've got, I know, 50, 51 or two couples signed up for this. So that's a lot of couples going to be here. Uh, if you're a married couple, you do not have to be a member of the church to see us. Matter of fact, we've got two names on there that we don't even know who they are. But uh, that's all right. If you come, uh, we'd love to have you. That'd be a real blessing. This is a message for all the teenagers. And I apologize, guys. I'm trying to fight sneezing. My sinuses are love changing the weather. Uh, but anyway, we're going to go to Mountain View Baptist Church on October the 4th. Uh, they're having a special youth rally that night, Friday, October 4th. Excuse me. About to get plumb broken up and cry. October the 4th on Friday night, and that's going to be at 7.30. And uh, the Mountain View uh, Youth Choir is going to be singing. The Reigns family is going to be singing. And then Brother Justin Cooper is going to be preaching. And that's going to be great. Some of you have heard Brother Cooper up at Crown, so I know you'll enjoy him. That's going to be on Friday, October 4th. And I'll say more to you about that. Brother Kimmer and I are going to be taking you uh, down there. Also, uh, for all of the junior age kids, uh, after service tonight, uh, just to let you know, Brother Justin and Miss Natalie are going to be staying an hour after service, uh, and you're going to be playing in the Gaga Ball Pit uh, for about an hour. Uh, if you would, bring a change of clothes for that. So if you are junior age kids... You're going to be playing gaga ball, whatever that is, and nine square. I guess that's stuff y'all put up back there in the back. And they're going to be doing that with Brother Justin Woolwich and Miss Natalie. That will be after service tonight. So don't forget that. And Brother Hamlin, if you want to go out to service with them out there and play gaga ball, you can as well. All right? And uh, But anyway, uh, I don't know what it is, but maybe it'll be fun. And we'll see what goes on with that. So if you would, I'll just remember these things. And... Uh, a lot of announcements. Don't forget, uh, Brother Jotham and Sammy CDs, they're going to take them up this morning. If you would like to uh, have any of those CDs, uh, get them this morning or you can see them later. And I think that takes care of everything. All right? All right. So we're going to have a song for you this morning. Then I'll introduce the preacher.
each one by faith. Standing on Jordan's stormy shore, I lift my trembling voice once more. I know how I made it. children are leaving one by one passing this way and going home signs of the times reveal we don't have very long but each one who stands upon that shore waving goodbye as they to God will leave here singing that same sweet song. I know how I made it. I know how I made it. I made it by God's amazing grace. Steps that are slower now I've taken, each one by faith. Standing on Jordan's stormy shore, I lift my trembling voice once more. I know how I made it. I know how I made it. I made it by God's amazing grace. I know how I made it. I know how I made it. I made it by God's that are slower now I've taken each one by faith standing on Jordan's stormy shore I lift my trembling voice once more I know how I made it I know how I made it I made it by God's amazing I know how I made it. I know how I made it. I made it by God's amazing grace. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Toby. I appreciate that. Good singing, Sister Sellers, Miss Amy, and I always enjoy that. Tonight, the choir is going to be singing that song still that you've heard them do. And we found out, uh, Brother Just, uh, brother James was telling me, that that song was inspired by a message that Dr. Hamlin had preached. And that song still was inspired by that. And so the choir will be doing that tonight. It is a joy to have all the way from Michigan, uh, around the Detroit area, Brother John Hamlin. He is one of my favorite preachers. He preaches, why do you get Brother Hamlin? Well, he always gives you something to help you, but I love to hear him preach. I like good Bible preaching, and I'm glad he's with us today. Let's all stand and honor God's man as he comes to the pulpit. Dr. Hamlin, such a joy to have you with us, and we appreciate it. Brother Hamlin celebrating 40 years in evangelism this year, 40 years. And we praise the Lord for that. Great to have you, sir. Sure, love you, man. Love Thank you, you sir. Man. Open your Bibles, the book of Acts, <clears throat> chapter number 13. Book of Acts, chapter number 13. What a wonderful joy and blessing it is to be back at the great Calvary Baptist Church in Statesville, North Carolina. I'll be forever grateful for that day when God allowed my path to cross with Dr. Chris Hazlett, uh, Mrs. Hazlett, the Hazlett family, and I believe knitted our hearts together. Uh, Dr. Hazlip is not uh, an associate, he's not an acquaintance, but he is an actual friend. And I'm always excited and elated when I get to come and preach in this pulpit. And I love to hear this choir, one of my favorite choirs, Brother James, is the choir that you lead. In fact, I was thinking as they were singing a moment ago, I've never heard this choir sing, but what something happens in my heart. And I appreciate uh, our sister and brother that sang a moment ago. 
And there's nowhere in the fundamental world I'd rather be today than right here at the great Calvary Baptist Church, Statesville, North Carolina. Now, I know that you uh, are thinking that's just uh, evangelist talk. And uh, he says that wherever he goes. But I can promise you I don't say that wherever I go. If you uh, stick your finger in my belt loop and uh, travel with me a little bit, you might hear me stand and say, you know, this church, not speaking of the Calvary Baptist Church in Statesville, North Carolina, but this church is one of my least favorite places to come. <laughs> People smile, say amen, and don't even realize they've just been insulted. But without question, without question, this is one of my favorite places to be. Thank you so much, Dr. Hazlett, for the privilege of being here this Lord's Day. And uh, I just love Dr. Hazlett, love his family. In fact, if you don't like them, <laughs> I don't like you. And I just think the world of him. I like friends that uh, because they're busy and I'm somewhat busy, we just uh, pick up where we last left off. Uh, I have found, uh, found that the people that you have to talk to nearly every day or every week outside of your own family, usually they're the ones that fall out with you the fastest and the first. And so I like friends that because we're busy in the work of the Lord, all of us, we just pick up where we last left off. And every time we get together, it's like a family reunion. A book of Acts chapter 13, and I'll begin reading with verse number 14 through verse number 16 where we find the text to the message. Book of Acts chapter 13 beginning with verse number 14 through verse number 16. And when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand said, Men of Israel, and ye that fear God, give audience. Please look back with me at verse number 15. Book of Acts chapter 13 and verse number 15. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. A little phrase in this verse that right recently absolutely caught and captured my attention, and I'm praying that it will do the same for you this morning. It is a two-word phrase, and it's that phrase, say on. Do you see it? There it is, the phrase, say on. And for a few moments, I want to speak to you on the subject this morning, say on, preacher, say on. <laughs> Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this privilege to stand behind a sacred desk to preach the Word of God. If in my heart I want to be a blessing, but the only way that I can be is if you hide me behind the cross and fill me with the Spirit. Place a hedge around this great church by the blood of Christ to keep the devil and his demons from hindering this service. Save the sinner and stir the saint. Heavenly Father, for all that you'll do in our midst and even in our hearts this morning, we will be careful to give you all the praise and honor and glory. Bless and protect my precious family as I'm away. Give us fresh warm bread from the oven of heaven to feed from this morning. And Lord, I'd request, oh, how I would request that you'd clothe me in my calling 
For we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. Every person in the pew has the biblical privilege to expect certain eternal principles and precepts to come from every preacher in the pulpit. Topics like Calvary, consecration, commission of the church, and countless others shouldn't be as scarce in sermons as a drinking fountain in the Mojave Desert. The anticipation of the congregation should be more than met by the articulation of the clergy. Say on, preacher, say on. In the book of Acts, chapter 13, we find the Apostle Paul's sermon in the synagogue at Antioch in Pisidia. Its theme is justification by faith. Now this chapter could be easily or effortlessly outlined like this. A great decision, verses 1 through 3. A gracious deputy, verses 4 through 12. A grievous disappointment, verse 13. A glorious declaration, verses 14 through 41. A gentle delegation, verses 42 through 49. And then a grim departure, verses 50 through 52. It is well the physician Luke is dealing under the direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit with a glorious declaration that a person reads a heart captivating small phrase. Verse 15, and after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, and here's the phrase, say on. This very same thing, Dr. Hazlip, took place during the Lord Jesus Christ uh, earthly ministry. Luke 4, 16. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Evangelist Oliver B. Green, God bless his sainted memory, once wrote about our text. This was the customary order of worship in the synagogue. He went on to write after the opening formalities and prayers, oh, someone read aloud from the books of the law and the readings were so arranged that the entire Pentateuch was read through in order in the course of three years. After the reading of the designated passage, the rulers of the synagogue would call on whomsoever they would as speaker on that occasion or Oliver B. Green wrote, uh, any members of the congregation could ask permission to speak. There are two small overlooked words that this entire narrative orbits around and they are the tiny statement, say on. In the Greek language, uh, it simply means to break the silence about. Never forget, uh, the anxious ear of the pew uh, should never go without hearing the authoritative, thus saith the Lord, voice of the pulpit. Now if you miss everything that I preached this morning, I pray that you would not miss that. And it even bears repeating, the anxious ear, the anxious ear, the anxious ear of the pew uh, should never go without hearing the authoritative, thus saith the Lord, voice of the pulpit. Friend, you and I, uh, both the unsaved and the saved, ought to sit on the edge of our seats uh, when hearing eternal statements shouting, uh, Say on, preacher, say on. Now quickly this morning, there are at least three truths. That the pew should be eager to hear about from the pulpit, and they're all found in the Apostle Paul's first sermon to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 13. Let's quickly notice it this morning. Say on, preacher, say on. Number one, the artisan of salvation. Verse 23, of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior 
Jesus, a truth that the pew should be eager to hear about from the pulpit is the artisan of salvation. Now that word artisan simply means a worker in a skilled trade, especially one that involves making things by hand. I keep that in mind because we'll be going back to it momentarily. In verse 23, the physician Luke tells us that the apostle Paul makes the sure and swift transition in his sermon from uh, David to uh, the divine Son of God. Someone is well said of the Moses of the New Testament, all roads in Paul's preaching led to Christ. He plainly and yet powerfully introduced his audience not to a martyr of religion, but the Savior of the world. Is it any wonder that the songwriter would take the songwriter's pen and place upon songwriter's paper those soul penetrating words? Majestic sweetness sits enthroned upon the Savior's brow, his head with radiant glories crowned, his lips with grace or flow. He saw me plunged in deep distress and flew to my relief. For me he bore that shameful cross and carried all my grief. His hand a thousand blessings pours upon my guilty head. His presence gilds my darkest hour and guards my sleeping bed. Now a person can call the Lord Jesus Christ the artisan of salvation because the scriptures uh, gives us these fascinating uh, uh, facts uh, about both his earthly and heavenly ministry. He was a carpenter. Is not this the carpenter? Mark 6, 3. His sinless hands were nailed to an old rugged cross. They pierced my hands and my feet. Psalm twenty two sixteen. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. John 20 and 27. And he is at this very moment leading the construction crew in heaven. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go and prepare a place for you. John 14, 2. Amen. Amen and amen. Friend, you and I ought to be sitting on the edge of our seats uh, shouting, Say on, preacher, say on, when hearing about the artisan of salvation. The Bible says in Acts 4.12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Listen closely, creeds, communion, catechism, charitable donations, cycling around the neighborhood with a white shirt, an ugly necktie, say amen right there, and a nameplate or a thousand and one other things uh, won't get your sins forgiven, uh, but trusting Christ uh, and Him alone will. By the way, life's too short to wear an ugly necktie. Say amen right there. Bless your heart. Some of you look like you got one from Liberace's garage sale on this morning. I felt a kick right there. Well, on her deathbed, an old faithful child of God had a Catholic priest show up uninvited and unannounced in her hospital room, telling that she was there to, or he was there to absolve her of all of her sins. She politely, with some of her last words, uh, uh, Dr. Hayslip uh, asked to see his hands, examine them closely, and then said, no, you're completely unqualified to take away my sins. Surprised, uh, the priest queried, I don't understand what you mean. I'm a priest of the Holy Catholic Church uh, appointed uh, uh, to my uh, parish by the bishop. The dear woman replied, I don't know anything about all that. 
But what I do know is the one who forgave me of all of my sins saved my wretched soul and very soon is going to welcome me into heaven. He had nail-pierced hands and his name is the lovely Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, you and I ought to be shouting, Say on, preacher, say on, when hearing about the artisan of salvation. Number two, let me hasten. The access of salvation, please look at it, verse 26. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever, and whosoever, I'm stuck, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation set. A truth that the few should be eager to hear about from the pulpit is the access of salvation. In verse 26, the physician Luke tells us that the apostle Paul puts out uh, the welcome mat before all people in regards to the free and the forever uh, pardon of sin. One Bible student wrote, of this scene in the scriptures, here Paul's invitation included Gentiles, proselytes, all who are under the sound, all that were within the sound of his voice. Justification by faith is for all. Now can I go ahead and preach this morning? The only way that a person could miss the wonderful whosoever will doctrine in the Bible would be to read the Bible closed upside down and translated in Martian. That's the only way that anybody could ever miss the wonderful whosoever will doctrine in the Bible. While I'm on that, let me go ahead and get on this. There's a whole lot of bad theology that could be corrected by a personal worker's New Testament and a stack of gospel tracts. I got to my plane seat last night about uh, 828 to wing my way from Detroit to Greensboro. And as I got to my plane seat and got situated and cinched uh, the seat belt around my waist, the uh, flight attendant came on the PA and she said, if I'm lying, I'm frying. She said, we have on board a passenger who has a severe allergic reaction to peanuts and so there'll be no snacks. That grieved me. It did, it grieved me. Because everything on that snack cart I can have on my diet because I'm on the Fatkins diet. Oh, you've heard of the Atkins, but I'm on the Fatkins diet. And that, uh, that grieved me a little bit when they said there'll be no snacks uh, on the flight uh, because there was a passenger that had a severe uh, allergic uh, reaction uh, uh, to uh, uh, peanuts. Uh, but then I thought, uh, uh, Dr. Hazlip, uh, of my biblical severe reaction uh, uh, and allergic uh, uh, response that I have to Calvinism. Knock, knock. Knock, knock. Not a Calvinist, they don't knock on doors. <laughs> Friend, you and I ought to be sitting on the edge of our seats shouting, Say on, preacher, say on, when hearing about the access of salvation. Amen. Now, there are several tenets or truths that unmistakably teach that God wants everyone to be saved. And it may shock you, stun you, and even surprise you. But first of all, the passion of the cross. Luke 23, 34, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. Uh, a tenant that unmistakably teaches that God uh, wants uh, everyone to be saved is the passion of the cross. Uh, while crowned in thorns and robed in blood, the Son of God makes clear that nobody uh, is ever ushered away from Calvary unable to be saved. Amen. Hear me and hear me well. If you die and go to a devil's hell, you won't be able to blame God the Father. You won't be able to blame God the Son. You won't be able to blame God the Holy Ghost. If you die and go to a devil's hell, you'll have to blame yourself. The 
passion of the cross. Secondly, there is the plan of the church. Mark 16, 15, and he said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Oh, a tenant that unmistakably teaches that God wants everyone to be saved is the plan of the church. Common sense says God wouldn't ask the local church to be in the every creature reacher business if he hadn't authorized them to be in the every creature reacher business. Don't make me say that again. The plan of the church. Thirdly, the prayer of the Christian. A Romans 10.1, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. A tenet or a truth that unmistakably teaches that God wants everyone to be saved is the prayer of the Christian. You'll never convince the believer that just saw God answer a prayer in the saving of a friend, a family member, or a fellow worker that he isn't interested or concerned with saving others too. All oh, that every single person that was in this service this morning would realize, I feel a preaching storm getting ready to break in here this morning, really I do, that he'd understand uh, that uh, the passion of the cross and the plan of the church uh, and the prayer of the Christian are unmistakable tenets that teach that God wants everyone to be saved. When the Prince of Wales visited India, there was a number of high caste people who were waiting to shake hands with him. Uh, he was there to represent the emperor or the king and the empire. And but between uh, him, uh, that high caste group of people, and what we would call the masses or the common folk, uh, there was, uh, uh, Dr. Hayslip, a barrier separating them. The prince arrived, shook hands with those that were presented to him, and then looking over their heads to the crowds beyond, said, take those barriers down. They were taken down, and everyone, and everyone... And everyone who wanted uh, had free access to the prince. Amen. The next time he came that way, 10,000 outcasts uh, gathered under a banner that they had made. And the banner read, the prince, the prince, the prince of the outcasts. Oh, when you and I trusted Christ as our Savior, we came under that very same warm and welcoming banner. Because Jesus is the prince of the outcasts. The access of salvation. And then number three, and last of all, my time is gone. And I'm out like Rosie O'Donnell in a beauty contest. Ah, <laughs> oh, God wasn't in that, but it, it was hilarious. It really was. <laughs> Not only the artisan of salvation and the access of salvation, but number three, and last of all, the authenticity of salvation. Verse 30, but God raised him from the dead. A truth that the pew should be eager to hear about from the pulpit is the authenticity of salvation. In verse 30, the physician Luke tells us that the apostle Paul takes an important excursion in his sermon uh, to the cemetery to tell about the greatest affirmation of Christianity, which is the resurrection of Christ. The fact that Jesus rose from the dead was well attested. And there were those in the crowd who saw his miracles, heard Dr. Hazlip his teaching, but far more importantly stood at the edge of his empty grave and they were witnesses that could not be denied. Dr. John R. Rice once said uh, that the resurrection of Jesus Christ cannot be overestimated in its importance. The victorious resurrection puts a divine exclamation point on his virgin birth, 
in his vicarious death. See, how do you know what you believe is real? How do you know what you believe is genuine? Uh, how do you know what you believe is, uh, is authentic? Well, friend, simply put, the stone is rolled away. The stone is rolled away. The stone is rolled away. Muhammad is still in the grave. Buddha is still in the grave. Uh, uh, Mary Baker Patterson, Eddie Glover, who's the founder of Christian science, which is neither Christian nor science. It's like grape nuts. They're neither grape nor nuts. She is still in the grave. They tell me Dr. Hazlip that in Mary Baker Patterson, Eddie Glover's grave, by her request, in her coffin, there's a phone. She asked for a phone to be put in her coffin that she might be able to call back from eternity. I'd love to trade phone bills with her. She has never picked up that phone. She has never dialed that number. There's never been a call that's come from her coffin. But Jesus is alive. But Jesus is alive. But Jesus is alive. Friend, you and I ought to be sitting on the edge of our seat shouting, Say on, preacher. Say on. When hearing about the authenticity of salvation. The Bible says in 2 Peter 1.16, If we have not followed kindness, devised up fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ but were our witnesses of his majesty if the stone was not rolled away get a cigarette lighter from a Baptist deacon I'll let you catch up get a cigarette lighter if anybody's got one in the service, it is a Baptist deacon. He's holding it for his wife. If the stone was not rolled away, get a cigarette lighter from a Baptist deacon and burn all the pews, all the hymn books, all the offering plates, the pulpit, the Lord's Supper table, and even the church bell with the steeple. But since the stone was rolled away, I'd give that Baptist deacon back his cigarette lighter before he goes into a nicotine fit Amen. it's real it's real Amen. hallelujah it's real Amen. the authenticity of salvation I'm closing with this when Michelangelo commonly known by his first name I was preaching the other night in a conference uh, Dr. Hazlip and I mentioned Michelangelo, I was quoting him, and as I was quoting him, I, I sensed the crowd needed a little bit of help, uh, not that this crowd does, but Michelangelo, and I'm not speaking of one of the Ninja Turtles, <laughs> and preaching the other night at the conference, I, I mentioned Michelangelo, and I said, not a Ninja Turtle, and I watched the moderator pull out his pen and turn to the flyleaf of his Bible and write, not the Ninja Turtle. Ah, you can't beat Bible preaching. You really can't. When Michelangelo, commonly known by his first name, an Italian sculptor, painter, architect, and poet of the high Renaissance period who exerted an unparalleled influence on the development of Western art, when Michelangelo visited several art galleries in European cities, he was deeply impressed by the preponderance of paintings depicting Christ hanging on the cross. He asked, why are the art galleries filled with so many pictures of Christ upon the cross? Christ dying. Uh, why do artists, Michelangelo queried, concentrate upon that passing episode as if it were the last word of the final scene? And then Michelangelo said, Christ dying on the cross lasted 
for only a few hours but for the end to the unending eternity Christ is alive Christ rules and reigns and triumphs and if I may add a writer to that legendary figure of history statement I'd say an old time Christianity an old time Christianity an old time Christianity is real The authenticity of salvation. Oh, every time we gather at the Calvary Baptist Church in Statesville, North Carolina, Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, midweek prayer meeting, every night a revival meeting, every night a Bible conference, every night a mission conference, every night a tent meeting, man, we ought to be sitting, Brother James, on the edge of our seats uh, saying, say on, preacher, say on, because we know that this blessed book is going to be opened and it's going to be preached. The answer is not the White House. The answer is the church house. And the reason that the answer is the church house is because we hear from the book of God. Say on, preacher. Say on. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. In this service this morning, there are two kinds of people. Those that are saved and those that are lost. And I wonder with every head bowed and every eye closed who could lift their hand and say, Dr. Hamlin, I know that I know that I know that I know. If I were to die right now, heaven is my eternal home. I'm saved and sure. I wonder who would lift their hand and leave it saved and sure. Saved and sure. Saved and sure. Thank you. You may put them down. You're here this morning, dear one, and you couldn't raise your hand, but you would lift it now. And by lifting it, thank you, sir, you would say, I need to be saved and I need to trust Christ. And preacher, I, I don't want to die and go to a devil's hell. And right now you'd lift your hand and say, pray for me. Pray for me. God bless you there. Others. I need to be saved. I need to trust Christ. Preacher, I'm not sure if I were to die right now, heaven would be my eternal home. If you'd lift your hand, say, pray for me. You're here this morning, and as a Christian, it's been a long time since you got excited about hearing the preaching of the Word of God. I remember right after I got saved, Dr. Hazlett, 40 years this month. I remember right after I got saved, and I found out there was church on Sunday night, not just Sunday morning, Mrs. Hazlett, but Sunday night as well. And I remember staring at my watch after the morning service and counting down the hours. I could go back to the house of God and hear the Word of God preached. And then I found out, I remember, how they had this thing that was uh, called the midweek prayer meeting. And then just as soon as I hit Monday, I began saying three days till Wednesday, two days till Wednesday, one day. To... Couldn't wait to get back to the house of God to hear the word of God preached. And friend, you'll have to pardon me, but if what you have doesn't get you to church, it just may not get you to heaven. The Bible salvation puts within our soul a longing, a craving, a desiring, the hearing of the Word of God. I'm not proud of this, Brother Hazlip. I didn't know any better, and that's no excuse. And I'm not proud of it. But I remember when Mrs. Hamlin and I were dating, she had a curfew at 11 o'clock. I'd drop her off. I couldn't wait to jump in the car and tune into some half-baked, I didn't know it then, unbiblical radio so-called preacher. And it, I shouldn't have listened to it. And I didn't know any better, and that's no excuse. But I didn't even listen to stuff that wasn't even true. Somebody said it was the Bible. I found out later that's not a good thing. 
And I'm not endorsing that. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is there ought to be, there ought to be something on the inside that makes you want to hear the Bible preached. That makes you want to hear the Bible taught. There ought to be something in there that cause you to have that spiritual appetite. And dear friend, if you don't have that, you may need to check up this morning. I wonder who'd lift their hand as a Christian and say, Preacher, I know I'm saved, but it's been a long time since I had that thrill for the truth of the Word of God. And you'd lift your hand this morning. God bless you there and, and others. Others, been a long time. I want to have that excitement back for hearing the Word of God. You'd lift your hand. Or you'd lift your hand and say, Preacher, I'm enjoying a season of enthusiasm, and I don't want that season to wane. And by the way, if it does, it'll be your fault. If it comes to the place where, Brother James, I'm not excited about hearing the Bible preach, it's not God's fault. It's my fault. It's my fault. You say, Preacher, I'm in that season where, where it's fresh and it's exciting and it's new, though I've been saved a long time. I want to make sure I keep my heart right. You'd lift your hand all over the house, all over the house, all over the house. God bless you. Thank you. May put them down. You're here this morning, and I don't know how to put it any other way, but you just need old-fashioned get right with God. And you say, Dr. Hamlin, that's me. I need to get right. You'd lift your hand. We stand to our feet with our heads bowed, our eyes closed. Heavenly Father, thank you for the kind attention of these dear people. And Lord, I pray that not one in any way would grieve, resist, or quench the Holy Spirit. May this be a time of great and glorious victory in Jesus' name. With our heads bowed, you may need to unite with the Calvary Baptist Church or follow the Lord in believer's baptism. Whatever the decision as Brother James sings by himself the hymn of invitation, right now would you come as our brother sings. My name is God bless you. That's it. That's right. Something you need to do this morning. A decision that you need to make. Oh, I never want to get to the place, Dr. Hazlett, where that excitement and that enthusiasm for the Word of God wanes. Why not come this morning, <coughs> find a place at this altar, and just do business with God this morning. People are coming. People are coming. What about you? Say on, preacher. Say on. excitement for the word of God I promise you I know where you'll be tonight come the preaching hour if there's an enthusiasm for the word of God I promise I can tell you where you'll be on an off night and there's a fundamental revival meeting going on if there's that enthusiasm and excitement for the Bible I, I can tell you where you'll be when your church meets for a midweek prayer meeting yes Bible study too Dr. Hazlip, Dr. Lee Robertson said in my hearing once, they called him the Charles Haddon Spurgeon of his day. Dr. Lee Robertson said in my hearing once, he said the crowd on Sunday morning in a fundamental church speaks of the popularity of uh, the church. And he said the crowd on Sunday night speaks of the popularity of the preacher. And then Dr. Robertson, that great man of God, said in my hearing, and the crowd on Wednesday night speaks of the popularity of Jesus. Oh, dear friend, if we're excited about the Bible, Dr. Hazlip could spring an afternoon service on us, including the Sunday night service. We get our Bible and come. Something you need to do, decision you need to make. Oh, that right now you'd come.
The pastor takes charge of the service. All my name is written there. Ms. Amy, you just play softly this morning, if you would. Would you look up here at me just a moment? When he was reading this passage of the Word of God, I couldn't help but to think about where the Bible talked about the encouragement and how that we can be an exhortation for the people. And I will say this to you today. My wife and I were talking about this morning, a little bit on the way to church. Uh, we live in a day-to-day -day of people have to be popular today. Preachers even have to be popular, singers, whatever. But the thing is, and this is what concerns me, is why don't we just excited, as Dr. Hamlin's preached, about the Word of God? Why are we excited about, more excited about the Word than the man that delivers it? More excited about the Word uh, than the personality. And friend, it's the Word of God that will change our life. Amen. And I want to encourage you to think about what was said this morning. And uh, listen, those things are going to be set on, say on, going to be set on from this pulpit for a long time to come. Amen. I'm glad there's a whosoever will gospel. And I'm glad that everybody can be saved. Amen. Father, thank you this morning for the wonderful time we have had in the house of God. Lord, thank you for reminding us today, Lord, that this precious word God has said to us that Jesus saves. Lord, I know there may be someone in this auditorium, no doubt, has never trusted you as their Savior. Lord, I pray today would be the day of their salvation. Lord, I pray, God, you'd have your will and way. You would move. And, God, I pray even throughout this day, Lord, if their heart would be stirred, they'd get a hold of somebody and say, tell me about Jesus. Lord, thank you today for the man of God bragging on the Lord. God, thank you today for this good number, this good day in the Lord. Now I ask you, God, to give us a good time in the Lord tonight. Speak to our heart. Give us what we need. Lord, as Brother Hamlin prays uh, so often, God, Lord, we need that fresh bread from heaven. God, we need that. Lord, we need that. Lord, we're just one beggar telling another beggar where to get bread. So, Lord, I pray, let us all be glad of our salvation. In Christ's name, all God's people say it. I want you to look at me just a moment before you head out the door. Thank you, Miss Amy. I want you to look at me. I want to say something to you. Don't ever get over being saved. Amen. Just the very joy of knowing that you are saved. Don't ever get over being saved. Amen.